Before the time of Hippocrates, which was around 400 BC, from Europe to India, disturbances in behavior were widely attributed to the work of various gods or other abstract metaphysical entities. In ancient Mesopotamia, for example, one of the recorded illnesses was known as the Hand of Ishtar, while another was called the Hand of Shamesh. If there was hope of correcting these disturbances, the hope consisted of the possibility that the priests might be able to vanquish the demon or expel the possessing deity by a process of various rituals, potions, or even the famous procedure called trepanation, in which a hole was drilled into the skull to allow the nefarious ghost to leave the head. To most modern people, this all sounds quite exotic, superstitious, and of course dangerous. In all, extremely primitive. In this video, I want to suggest instead that nothing has changed in 6,000 years and that modern psychiatrists are now playing the role of the exorcist priests. Using procedures and cocktails that are just as superstitious and probably more dangerous. And further, I will argue that they have no more science to support their practice than the ancient priests did, and that their claim to authority up to and including using the state to force patients into submission, is exactly as unjustified as the ancient models were. Everything is the same, except for one thing. Most people are able to see now that the ancient practices were barbaric and ineffective and superstitious and therefore unjust whereas most people now are unable to recognize the same in the field called psychiatry. So let's begin with an examination of the word psyche, the word which serves as the root for psychology and psychiatry, for psychotic and psychopathic, as well as psychedelic. The word is derived from the Greek word psyche, meaning the soul, mind, spirit, life, one's life, the invisible animating principle or entity which occupies and directs the physical body. Biblical scholar James Tabor makes an important note about soul as it was understood in the Old Testament. Before I read it to you, Note that the Greek word psyche was used to translate the Hebrew word nefesh, meaning soul, when the Septuagint was composed, and it is the closest analog. However, it seems the Greek word is closer to our modern understanding of soul. Listen, here's the note from Tabor. Quote, the ancient Hebrews had no idea of an immortal soul living a full and vital life beyond death, nor of any resurrection or return from death. Human beings, like the beasts of the field, are made of dust of the earth, and at death they return to that dust. The Hebrew word nefesh, traditionally translated living soul, but more properly understood as living creature, is the same word used for all breathing creatures and refers to nothing immortal. The same holds true for the expression translated as the breath of life. It is physical, animal life. For all practical purposes, death was the end. In other words, as Wikipedia frames this point, the traditional concept of an immaterial and immortal soul distinct from the body was not found in Judaism before the Babylonian exile around 587 BC but developed as a result of interaction with Persian and Hellenistic philosophies. So before what Karen Armstrong calls the Axial Age, basically during the period of the bicameral mind, the term that would have been used was something like life force. Eventually, due to later developments in philosophy and theology, this term, which the Hebrews had labeled nefesh, became located in the mind, or the reason, 
in what we recognize as psyche. But it's interesting that even as late as Homer, the life force in the Greek world was not necessarily understood to dwell only in psyche. It could, it could also be found in thumos, nous, minos, phrenes, ker, ether, and cardi. So we may say that the early Greeks had an idea that our minds were more diffuse and located not only in our heads, but sort of throughout our bodies. Consequently, any equivalent to our modern psychiatrist would have had to be a master of the entire physiology of the body. And also, consequently, and interestingly, the ancient Hebrew equivalent in the days of Abraham and Moses would have been basically a medical doctor, a physician, someone capable of maintaining and restoring life force to the body. A priest was to be a healer. The point here is that the master of psyche in the early days was an expert in physical health and did not deal in micromanaging a person's personality tics and various neuroses. Please think also here of Jesus' interactions with both the physically ill and the possessed or the mad. From the ultra-ancient POV, there would not have been much distinction to notice here. But, very interestingly, the time of Jesus is almost exactly when these notions begin to realign. In fact, although psyche appears in Homer's writing and is used to translate the notion of nefesh in the Septuagint, and it is used by Paul in the New Testament and by the Gospel writers, although probably mostly in the Hebrew sense, although, I mean, we could hem and haw about this. See Matthew 10.28, uh, for example. But in any case, the earliest myth mythologization of Psyche appears in Aquilius's novel, The Golden Ass, which was published in the second century AD. Get your timelines right here. This is extremely late to add a new myth to the Greco-Roman pantheon, and yet it was done. It became very popular. The story of Psyche and Eros seems to be the culmination of a centuries-long reconceptualization of the nature of psyche, which of course means the nature of psychology. Before I continue or move on, look at these beautiful paintings that feature psyche and ask with me why psyche is depicted this way. Why is psyche always a beautiful woman? She is said to be the most beautiful woman in the world. And why does she first appear in mythology in a story where she is awakened by Eros, which is Cupid, whom we know immediately as the representation of romantic love? Look at this painting called The Awakening of Psyche by Guillaume Seignac and try to see through it to the idea of psyche itself, like the idea, the, the platonic idea of psyche. If you need help here, watch my previous video, the one about Plato's Hippias Major, by the way, full of these nude paintings, right, where I argued, well, just what I said in this tweet, the artist paints the ideal as close as he can because it's the recognition or the anamnesis, which is the remembering. It's the anamnesis of the ideal that kicks the mundane, worldly mind into the higher level where it begins to seek the eternal, the incorruptible, the good, the beautiful. Finally, God. The important point here, and it really is an IQ 130 sort of an idea, so do your best to hang with me, is that psyche is first awakened by the feeling of romantic love, of eros, of Cupid. Man admires the form of a beautiful woman, and just then 
psyche comes online. And so what is psyche now, after this shift? Psyche is the reason, with a capital R, the judging mind, the conscience, even. If you're searching for a parallel here to help you make sense of this shift, it's in the 18th century, when Romanticism swept into Europe and did away with arranged marriages. And what followed was an era of individualism and, you know, modernism, with all its dizzying, disorienting social innovations and political realignments. See, before the lifetime of Jesus, and Christians might say before the coming of Logos, which is important, the coming of reason, right? Before that, the life, the life force, which was then called the soul, was understood to be entangled in or even coincident with the body. But the enmeshment of mind and body started to become unzipped a couple of centuries before Jesus. We see hints of it as early as Heraclitus and Parmenides. It is the Greeks who begin this unzipping, and it is the Babylonians who teach the Hebrews how to begin the unzipping. The term self is used dozens and dozens of times, for example, in Socrates' dialogue with Parmenides, and it's out of this dizzying effort to understand the nature of self that the Platonic, Socratic idea of forms finally takes shape. And what is that but the idea that there are more than merely physical things? So, from around 430 BC to the time of Apuleius is around 500 years. And in those 500 years, soul, or life force, psyche, shifts from being a body-based thing to being something that exists alongside or separate from the body. As a result, the idea of salvation, or anything like that, in the sense that Christians use it, could only appear after this reconceptualization took place. Which means, the gospel, with its promise of eternal life, could only have appealed to those who had already made this shift in definitions, and who had already understood that there is an immaterial counterpart to the body. So, now let's get our feet on the ground again. Consider the psychiatrist. What discipline has he mastered? Well, clearly, he is an expert in psyche, as his title suggests. But what does he imagine psyche to be? Is he taking the old definition, the one where psyche is that enmeshed amalgam of mind-body stuff that might require him to address, for example, chronic gut pain or heart palpitations or ringing ears? Instead, doesn't he suppose himself to be the expert in that unzipped psyche that does not include the body, the, the immaterial thing? the platonic form of self itself, the soul. It seems to me that the modern psychiatrist generally believes himself to be a specialist in this latter sort of psyche, which almost by definition reveals him to be claiming the status of priest. For who but a priest claims to be an expert in the processes and disorders of the immaterial soul itself? And yet, there's a crack in the foundation here. These modern priests do resort to chemical medicine to treat the disorders of the soul. So we have to investigate how it is possible that a molecule delivered in a pill the size of a mustard seed can remedy disorders in an immaterial thing like soul, like psyche. Of course, I think if we pinned a psychologist to these definitions, he would wiggle away as quickly as possible. He would say, well, technically, I don't believe in an immaterial soul. Technically, 
he does think that mind is merely matter, which is to say, body. In order to preserve his authority, you see him retreat now into the old definition of psyche. You see him now aligning himself not with the post-Plato, post-Jesus, post-Apuelius definitions of psyche, but rather with old covenant-style life force. Now, to defend his authority, he aligns himself with the priests of ancient Mesopotamia, and only his terminology seems different. Instead of hand of Ishtar, he labels it schizophrenia. Instead of hand of Shamish, depression, and so on. And here it makes sense that the p-value statistical crisis has wrought havoc in the academic field of psychology. If we see modern trials showing that St. John's wort is as effective as Prozac and Zoloft in treating depression, and we know that St. John's wort was used to remove the hand of Shamish, well, now we've begun to get the lay of the land, haven't we? Of course, there's another chapter in this story. A good place to start this last chapter is on the Wikipedia page titled Political Abuse of Psychiatry in the Soviet Union. I'm sure some of you have heard this. This is where these modern priests became rather aggressive, adding all sorts of new diagnoses to accommodate a new regime, pathologizing, by redefinition, behaviors that had previously been categorized as benign or innocuous, now as dangerous. Politically dissident people were often diagnosed as suffering from sluggish schizophrenia. And here's the key part. The diagnosis then gave the state license to forcibly restrain these people. The very interesting thing about all of this is that although essentially all of the same apparatus has grown up in America in the current year, there is no page for political abuse of psychiatry in the United States of America. There have been some prominent criticisms. Quoting from psychotherapy.net, Thomas Saz, who died in 2012, maintained that unlike true diseases of the brain and body, mental illness is a destructive social construct that medicalizes living and deprives people of their dignity. According to Saz, medication, hospitalization, and mandated psychotherapy are little more than coercive, dignity-reducing forms of clinical practice. Saz himself was a practicing psychiatrist, and that certainly adds to his credibility, but he has been considered controversial and is often mocked by believers as a quack. Of course, it is even more difficult for people lacking comparable credentials to make the same sorts of criticisms. And yet, I don't think it should be. Psychiatry adherents, or defenders of the faith, will say, oh, Saz is a nut job. But to presuppose that the only valid criticism of the discipline can come from within the field and can only be produced by adherents seems illogical. If we were to reject, say, Hinduism and the authority of Hindu priests, we're not particularly affected if Hindus come to us and demand that we present them with refutations of Hinduism that were published by Hindus, as if only Hindus have the right to reject Hinduism. But this is a widespread attitude among psychiatry adherents, and, and this is the part that's really a challenge, far more people in America are psychiatry adherents than understand themselves to be psychiatry adherents. Among millennials, something like one in five were diagnosed by a psychiatrist with a psychiatric disorder. If you are the type of person who shrugs and goes, well, if they got diagnosed, then I guess it's official. And that's that. 
Well, then I've got news for you. You might be a psychiatry adherent. And what do I mean by that label? I mean that you are a believer in the religion that is psychiatry. Oh, you scoff and say, what? No, I am a Christian or whatever. But it seems to me that you have allowed someone other than Christ to judge your soul, your psyche, you see. You had a hard time paying attention in public school. The teacher noticed you were always tapping your pencil and bouncing your knee up and down, forgetting to turn in your grammar worksheets. This suggested to her there was something wrong with you. But hey, she wasn't an expert. You should see a psychiatrist, she told your parents at parent-teacher conferences. Well, you had good parents, or at least well-meaning parents. They had even taken you to church pretty regularly. But when it came to having a hard time with the grammar worksheets, with the bouncing knee, well, this was serious stuff. This wasn't something the minister or priest could resolve. This was a problem with your psyche, and we know who the experts on psyche are, right? So they took you to visit the psychiatrist and gave you a form to fill out. It was worded very strangely. The test made you feel torn in different directions. The mystical results came back. Voila, you were diagnosed. Your son has ADHD. He'll need to take these pills every day. Your parents asked what causes it, but the explanation went over their heads. It had something to do with neurodevelopment and hyperkinesis, the limbic system, the orbitofrontal cortex. The good news was, there's a pill, and your parents' insurance company would cover most of the cost. The priest pronounced the blessing, and the healing had begun. Saz first presented his attack on mental illness as a legal term in 1958 in the Columbia Law Review. In his article, he argued that mental illness was no more a fact bearing on a suspect's guilt than is possession by the devil. In 1961, Saz testified before a United States Senate committee arguing that using mental hospitals to incarcerate people defined as insane violated the general assumptions of the patient-doctor relationship and turned the doctor into a warden and keeper of a prison. To me, this all seems like the definition of a false religion. Of course, nobody adheres to a false religion consciously. They do adhere to false religions because they are deceived into believing these to be the true religions. Such was the religion of Moloch, the cult that involved bringing children to it, this according to Second Kings, and passing the children through fire, or more specifically, through two fires, one on each side not physically harming them, notes the page about Moloch on jewishvirtuallibrary.org. Indeed, not physically harming them. If we give this the old Jungian Jordan Peterson once over, the fires on either side through which the children are passed suggest a passing them through a narrow opening. It is a process of limitation of setting artificial boundaries. Needless to say, the children of Israel, and that's us, you know, are commanded not to submit their children to this ritual. I also want to tell a quick story from my research into 19th century ideas. Not the phrenology phase of the discipline of psychiatry, though that's worth noting as one of the more absurd manifestations of this religion, right up there actually with the lobotomy phase, which came a century later. But no, this is the story of a diagnosis called moral insanity. And here's a little chunk from my dissertation, from the chapter on Herman Melville's Moby Dick. <laughs> 
As Jeffrey Sanborn has demonstrated, Melville was deeply engaged with the problem of the middle space between sanity and insanity at the time he was composing the book. Through scrupulous archival research, Sanborn proves that Melville read an 1823 article by Sir Francis Palgrave, and that Palgrave's article was the source for the famous marginalia comments discovered in Melville's Shakespeare set by Charles Olson in 1933 to 1934. Sanborn quotes from the original Palgrave essay. In considering the actions of the mind, it should never be forgotten that its affections pass into each other like the tints of the rainbow, though we can easily distinguish them when they have assumed a decided color, yet we can never determine where each hue begins. Madness is almost undefinable. Right reason and insanity are merely the extreme terms of a series of mental action which need not be very long. In his scribbling at the back of the seventh volume of Shakespeare, Melville dropped the almost and wrote, Madness is undefinable. But Palgrave's definitions were not uncontested in the first half of the 19th century. In fact, according to Paul McCarthy, most professional psychiatrists were comfortable enough with the term insane that they began defining and investigating subcategories, most interestingly, moral insanity. In his book, The Twisted Mind, McCarthy describes moral insanity as a mental disease which affects primarily the emotions and may affect the cognitive faculties. Symptoms include absence or diminution of feelings to pronounced displays of hatred, fear, or melancholy. As further evidence of Melville's better-than-superficial familiarity with the contested terminology of his day, McCarthy summarizes the famous 1844 trial of Abner Rogers, a case presided over by Melville's father-in-law, Judge Lemuel Shaw. McCarthy reports that Abner Rogers killed the asylum warden at the Massachusetts State Prison while suffering from delusions and because, in addition, he was driven to commit the crime by an uncontrollable impulse to do violence. According to the defense, McCarthy writes, Rogers claimed that he had heard voices stating that the warden would kill him. He therefore acted to protect himself. The verdict would be largely dependent upon Judge Shaw's definition of two key concepts, insanity and monomania. Although characters throughout Melville's fiction manifest these kinds of psychological disorders, none fits the description so thoroughly as Captain Ahab. And it wasn't just Melville concerned in the middle of the 19th century with these sorts of mental aberrations, the redefinitions, the recategorizations. Actually, since I have the time, a word about that opening epigraph from Emily Dickinson. Look at it again. It's a very concise argument. Much madness is divinest sense to a discerning eye. Much sense, the starkest madness. Tis the majority in this, as all, prevail. Assent, and you are sane. Demur, you're straightway dangerous and handled with a chain. Dickinson correctly identifies the frightful mechanism that gives this false religion its power. And that mechanism is democracy. So long as a majority believe the priests of the new religion and believe their definitions and accept their labels and their diagnoses and defer to their authority, there will be nothing you can do 
to prevent your own incarceration under their orders. But, my fellow Christians, do not despair. We have a priest of our own, and he warned us about this and told us how to handle such a situation. Matthew 10.28 says, And do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. And guess what Greek word the writer of the gospel used to indicate soul here? You got it. Psyche. Psyche.